So I was watching Dave Jones' EEV blog mailbag video in which he got a selenium rectifier and I've been meaning to make a video about not only selenium rectifiers but also copper oxide rectifiers so I figure this is a good time. I'll be putting them on a curve tracer and going over different types of rectifiers and their basic construction. So I have this standard handbook for electrical engineers Let's see what the copyright data is in here. 1949. But anyway, you know, it's got lots of cool stuff. It's always good to have a really old textbook like this so you can learn all the, you know, the basics of electronics from back in the day. And here's an example where they talk about the three basic type of metal disc rectifiers that they use. Here's the copper oxide, here's the selenium, and here's another one I've never seen, uh, some kind of magnesium and cupric sulfide. Actually, this says cuprous oxide here, for the, but I'm no chemist, so I'll just be saying copper oxide. And you can see for the copper oxide rectifier, the positive current flow goes from the oxide layer to the copper, and for the selenium, it goes from the from the metal, in this case iron, but you know, aluminum is also very common. It goes from the metal disc to the selenium layer um, in that direction. So that's anode and cathode, and anode and cathode. And here's a look at a selenium rectifier. You can see, you know, it's got six discs on here, so we got six diodes in the series for greater voltage handling capability. And you can see that the Here's the selenium layer, this, this round portion here that's coated on the aluminum disc and, and then painted on top of it. But that's where the selenium layer is. Actually, it's, the selenium is underneath this. This is a, a metal sputtering that's been put on top of it. And then there's this other spring-loaded washer here that's also put on. And you can see it's got, got that kind of washer in between all the different discs here and that just you know helps to spread out the electrical contact and uh, decrease the current density so you don't have localized heating right in the middle and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes um, I have some much larger ones but not on me right now so I can't show them to you right now but you know we've got big We've got small and medium size, and there's always the, the multi-diode package. This is a full-wave bridge rectifier. This, is, this was the convenient way to hook these things up together. You know, the bit basic four diodes in one package, and they were typically color-coded, almost always with yellow being the AC input. So these two pins would be your AC input, and red and black for the DC output. And because it's all mounted on the, a shaft like this, then the, the two DC cathodes output, they'd be on opposite sides, so you'd have to join these two together to get your, your DC negative output here and your positive output right here. Here's another example of the full wave bridge rectifier. We've got let me line this up properly. There you see, I uh, figured out a while ago there's eight different diodes in here. We've got one, this, this whole set right here, that's one full wave bridge rectifier, and then we got another set that's another full wave bridge rectifier. And these, and the convenient thing about selenium and copper oxide rectifiers is that they could be run in parallel, unlike with silicon diodes, these things, um, characteristic curves were much more forgiving to running them in parallel. So if you wanted greater current capacity, then you could always, um, you didn't need a bigger diode, all you just needed was more diodes and you put them all in parallel. So when I was in the middle of editing this video, I realized that I had a few other rectifiers to show you and here's a perfect example of one that um, where the diodes are in, in parallel with each other. We've got one full wave bridge rectifier set right here, another set right here, 
and both of those are wired in parallel. It's the exact same thing as taking both of these two silicon full wave retractifiers and putting them in parallel like that. But you wouldn't want to do that anyway because not only would, um, with the silicon characteristic curve, not only would one of these conduct much more current than the other one if you put them in parallel, but also one of these would be more than sufficient to replace this whole thing because this thing dissipates you know a lot more heat than than this one would for the same amount of current and and voltage applied to it um, anyway there's also right here the yellow the red and the black for the AC the positive and the negative and here's another one now this one is it could be a full wave bridge rectifier just with um, what have we got here? Seven diodes in each leg of that rectifier, but because you can see that there's the red, the yellow, and the black, but you can see that the two yellow ones, they're hooked up together, and this has never been used either. This is right here, the wire's exposed, and it's exposed there, and of course that's exposed, that's where you would hook up all the wires, but there's no solder residue on these things, so apparently this thing's never been used. It's a federal selenium rectifier. There's the part number. There's an NB24 on the back. So I'm not sure why these two are hooked up together. You can see, here's the schematic drawing of it. So looking at it like this, we got the two AC inputs all both hooked up together. There's the positive in the middle and the two negatives are also hooked up together and it looks just like a full wave bridge rectifier with the AC inputs shorted to each other. So these are in parallel and these are in parallel. Not sure why they would do that. Maybe this is supposed to be, this, this whole thing is supposed to be half of a full wave bridge rectifier and they would have, there would be another stack right next to it to, to have for the other half and so with all these series parallel combinations, that would increase the, um, the voltage and current capability for whatever this was designed to be put into. And got some nice sexy things here. Look at these. These are also federal selenium rectifiers. And these are inside glass tubes, kind of like very large fuse thing you, you you know put these inside a fuse socket basically and there's many little tiny little tiny discs all stacked up on top of each other and all held in place by the glass tube and I counted the discs there's like approximately 110 discs discs inside one of these and so if you estimate 20 20 volts per disc and you're looking at 2200 volts but probably 1000 volts would be the the safe estimate as to what this thing is rated for and got a couple other small ones here for about you know 200 maybe 300 volts maximum for these things and now for the copper oxide this is what I have to show there's these small copper discs basically they're just copper washer and they've been treated uh, to oxidize one side of it and um, and then on top of the oxide layer they would put on a little lead washer here and that's how all these things are stacked together just copper oxide lead copper oxide lead here's a stack of some larger discs from another copper oxide rectifier I took apart years ago and you can see that the oxide layer is quite brittle. Here's one that I sawed on a on a band saw, and you can see how it was, you know, the, the oxide just flaked off right there where the saw was going through. And another method of making contact with the oxide layer, instead of using lead washers, sometimes they would have a, a metal sputtered, a, a sputtered metal material onto the oxide layer in this case. They got one on the copper on the back of it too. Not really necessary, but I guess they just wanted to make sure that they were as very good 
electrical contact. But this is the same kind of sputtering material that you would see on the selenium rectifiers too if the, if the paint wasn't covering it up. And then over here on the curve tracer, we've got Tektronix Type 576 curve tracer and I got two selenium rectifiers here. In this case, I got this little green one here and one of the other gray one I showed you and I'm just looking at one single diode in each stack. And this is just a comparison between two different diodes. I can select them with this switch right here. So that's the left one and that's the right one. So here's the green one on the left and the gray one on the right. And first of all, you can see how there's um, a lot of hysteresis going on here. Let me put in a diode, a 1N4003 silicon diode, and you can see that there's no hysteresis here with the diode, so it's not really a product of the curve tracer. But once I put the selenium rectifier back in there, then we get the hysteresis going. Okay, so I'm going to look at the one on the left first, and we're tuned to 5 volts per division on the horizontal, 5 millivolts per division on the vertical. And I'm going to turn up the knob here, turn up the applied, the bias voltage. And right there from here to there, that's the prescribed 20 volts for one single diode, one single plate. And you can see in the vertical position, we've got about 20 milliamps. And let me zoom in here. Only about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volt diode drop, a forward drop going on there. But in the reverse bias, we have 10 milliamps, 10 milliamps reverse bias at 20 volts. So it would probably be better to keep it no, no greater than 12 volts for these selenium rectifiers. I mean, you can do 20 volts per plate, but you're just wasting a lot of energy in your circuit. I'm going to switch over to the right one now. And you can see this one has a much greater, much better characteristic curve. There's the 20 volt reverse bias, and you can see it's only about a 2 milliamp drop instead of a 10 milliamp drop. Here's the other one, got about 10 milliamps. Forward bias, let's look at that again. Here is the one on the right. Let me increase this. So we're looking at got 60 milliamp forward conducting current and about half a volt drop on the other one a little less than half a volt about point, point 0.3 point 0.4 volts as we saw before one one other interesting thing about these rectifiers with the the hysteresis going on here you know what this looks like i think it looks like a bees dick and uh, let me reverse the polarity. There, that's much better. Now on those previous measurements, I had the series resistor set to 3K, but this time I'll put it on 140. I really want to crank the current in these things and see what happens. And what I've noticed is if I turn it up, then we can see how the, the curve actually starts to go back on itself, both on the, the green rectifier on the left and the gray one on the right. That looks like negative resistance right there. Very interesting. Okay, now I'm gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison here. I got the green selenium rectifier and right here, I've got the, the small copper oxide disc. Um, the copper made contact with this 
alligator clip but insulated on this side so I have the lead washer that I cut and got that extended out to here to the other alligator clip. So I'm looking at the copper oxide right now. Let me change the horizontal. You can see how it in the forward bias it looks it's very linear just like a resistor it's just a, a straight slant almost we got at this point is 5 volts and 100 milliamps and if I switch over to the selenium you can see how that one looks much more like a, a diode regular silicon diode in the forward bias There's half a volt per division for the selenium and copper oxide that's off the charts. I gotta bring that back. And two other things to note here is that there's no hysteresis going on here. It's just straight up, down, both ways. There's no loop-de-loops and there's no negative resistance here if I really increase the reverse bias voltage. Well, maybe we have a little bit of hysteresis here forming now but that's just because it's it's probably getting hot now you can see how it's slowly changing like that I'll turn it down before I destroy it and yeah it's definitely getting hot I can I can just about hold on to it without burning my fingers all right now we're gonna compare the small copper oxide rectifier with the larger one that I showed you before and same setup as the small one on the large one. And right now looking at the large one, and this one looks even worse in the forward bias. Here's the large disc on the left and the small disc on the right. This is absolutely horrendous. This is really, this acts more like a resistor that has less resistance in the forward bias direction than it does in the reverse bias. So you can see in the forward bias here, we got 40 volts across this, across the diode, across the rectifier. I'm just wiggling it down here to see how hot it's getting, and it's, it's getting there. 40 volts, 50 volts maybe, in order to get 200 milliamp of forward current. And in the reverse, we got 10... Um, we got 50, 60, maybe 70 volts and about 70 milliamp reverse current. Really bad rectifier. That's why we don't use these things anymore. Well, there you go. That's a quick look at some selenium and copper oxide rectifiers. I'm not too keen on the history of these things as far as, you know, which one came first. I would imagine the copper oxide rectifier came first because it might have been easier to manufacture, you know, easier to just heat up the copper and uh, to build up that oxide layer, whereas, whereas the selenium needs to be sputtered on there with, in, with some manufacturing process. It needs to be sputtered onto the aluminum plate. That's all I got for now. Give this video a big thumbs up if you learned something.